you were here last week, we talked about what is necessary for revival, and, and, and we know that the first thing that we heard about revival, we, we saw in the book of Acts, and we, we saw in the book of Revelation, is this word. And it's one word that the Lord has continued to speak to me all week long, and, and, and I'm having to do it too. And it's the word repent. 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 And, and we, we take that word in, in our modern day mindset, and, and our idea of repentance is just a turning away from sin, and, and we, we engage in that. And, and, and sometimes I think for us as a church, when we think about repentance, we, we think about asking God for forgiveness, and it becomes a bit self serving because all it is is to make us better. We come to the recognition that without God, we are sick and, and we need a Savior. And so we ask for him to come and forgive us of our sins and, and to make us new again because we serve a God who has the ability to make all things new. And so we ask him to come and to do that in our lives and he makes things new, but, but we stop there and, and the other half of repentance is not asking for forgiveness. It's not a turning away from the things of this world, but it's a turning to the things of God. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with your whole heart. So many times we pursue the Lord with half of our heart. We pursue the Lord with, with half of who we are. We, we're, we're willing to pursue him right up to the level of our comfortability, and then we stop. And when it becomes uncomfortable or it looks like it's going to cost us a little more than we're willing to give, we stop and say, I'm satisfied. But I go back to the words of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane who knelt and he prayed, and the Bible said he prayed and his sweat became like drops of blood because of the intensity of his prayer. God, would we get there one day in Jesus' name? Some of you, you can't even move from where you are, much less sweat in prayer. I mean, you, you put forth more effort to walk to church or to get to church than you are right now while you're at church. I'm just going to tell you what, like it is. I mean, I love you. I love you, but I know that revival comes at a cost. Revival comes at a cost. So Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. You see, when, when we look at that, the day of Pentecost and we talk about revival and we look at what happened in, in the upper room and, and when the Holy Spirit fell, it, it, it was because there were some guys and some gals who, who were willing to do what nobody else was willing to do. You see, it was, it was party time in Jerusalem. It was the feast of the Passover, and people from all over to celebrate good times, you know. I, I, they were having a ball outside, people eating and laughing and dancing, celebrating. It was a party. But yet there was this group of people who said, you know what? We're going to do what no one else is willing to do. That while we're celebrating tradition, we're going to seek the God of tradition. Mm, let that sit in. But while we celebrate being at church, there's a group of people right now I know that are pursuing the God of the church. They're not celebrating because they're here, David. They're pursuing God with all they have. Why? Because it's not enough to be here. And there was a group of people on the day of Pentecost that said, you know what, you guys can party, you can celebrate, and what you're celebrating is a good thing, it's not a bad thing, but we don't want to celebrate the thing, we want to celebrate the maker of the thing. Amen. They got up in that upper room like Jesus told them to, and said, you wait, you wait for the promised Holy Spirit, who will come and baptize you with fire, and they waited. It was a peculiar people who waited while everyone else celebrated. And because of their obedience, they changed the world. Because they were willing to do what no one else was willing to do, God was going to do through them what he wouldn't do through everyone. 
And I'm here to tell you this morning, God wants to do something in this church that he's not doing through every other church. If we were willing to do, if, if we'll be willing to do what other churches aren't willing to do, which is to bypass our routine, bypass our ritual, and pursue relationship with Almighty God. If we will seek him and search him with our whole heart. And if we're going to receive what we've never received, it's going to require us to do maybe some things we've never done. You've heard it said before, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is the definition of insanity. Sometimes I think our walk with God is pretty insane because we have the same routine week in and week out, but we have the audacity to ask God to do supernatural things, while many of us live a superficial life. Mm-mm, mm, just everybody say, mm, because that's better than what you're responding. <laughs> we ask God to do supernatural things in our lives while we live a superficial Christianity. Mm, 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 mm. But if we truly want God to move in ways he's never moved, we're going to have to move in ways we've never moved. I believe that. We're praying for revival. That revival is going to require us to remove ourselves from what we've always thought was right, from what we've always thought was comfortable, from what we've always thought was the way we do church and begin to engage in some things that we maybe don't normally do, like coming up to the front of the little theater and praying, making an altar here and just pursuing God. But what about the worship? What, what about the word? What about announcements? What about visitors? What about, what about who cares? What about God? <laughs> What about what he wants to do rather than what we want to do? What about what God wants to do in your life today? Are we going to take the time here this morning and say, God, I wait for you. Do what you want to do. We sing it, but do we do it? It's one thing to sing it. It's another thing to do it. Obedience. God's not looking for agreement. God's looking for obedience. He doesn't need you to say yes. He doesn't need you to repeat Scripture. He needs us as a church to live it out. You can memorize it, but can you live it? You can champion it, but can you walk in it? You can celebrate it in other people, but can you lay your own life down? Can you lay your own life down and follow Jesus? That's what he's asking for. He's asking for us in this moment. He's asking the ocean in this time, in this place, to lay ourselves down on the altar. Surrender our lives to him. Submit ourselves to him and say, Lord, do what you want to do. And then when he says what to do, to get up from the altar and do it. That's the hard part, huh, Cat? It's fun to pray. It's fun to pursue. And when he speaks, to be at the altar and say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, but it's when you get up and you walk out the door and your life has to change. Oh, Lord, help us now. Come on. Whether that's turning away from or turning towards, we all know that's, that's the hard part. We can sit here and say, God, forgive us of our sins, but the hard part is to walk outside that door and stop sinning. Can I get an amen? Yeah. I mean, I'm just being honest this morning. I'm being real, okay? Because I want legitimate revival. I want true, authentic revival. He's not looking for our emotion. He's looking for our obedience. We can get emotional because we're singing a song that something in the lyrics touches us and, ooh, that's really cool. But God's not interested in our emotions. He's interested in our obedience. 
He's truly interested in us turning away from the things of this world and pursuing him. Not pursuing things of him. Don't pursue the gift. Pursue the giver of the gift. Because here's what happens. Here's what I found in my life. When I begin to pursue the gift, I'm forfeiting the greater gift that comes from knowing him. When I try to pursue what I think is awesome in God, and I try to pursue that gift maybe that I see God doing in somebody else's life or, or try to obtain something that, that a brother or sister in Christ is, is walking in or, or experiencing, and I say, man, I want that for my life, and, and I try to pursue that. I, I recognize oftentimes that I am forfeiting the greater gift that God has for me. It doesn't mean it's better than what my, my, the, my friend has. It just means that it's better for me. The greater gift for me is not found in duplicating my, my walk to somebody else's. The greater gift for me is found in my true surrender and God doing in me what he wants to do in me. Somebody say amen. amen. So it's, it's, not about, it's not about comparison. It's not about duplicating somebody else's relationship. It's about me surrendering my life and my relationship with the Lord so that he can do in me what he wants to do in me, which may be something totally different than he's doing in somebody else. Why? Because he knows me, and he knows the plans he has for me. And they may not be the plans he has for somebody else. And so if I'm, if I'm trying to live somebody else's dream, I'm forfeiting mine. And not only am I forfeiting my own dream, I'm forfeiting my future and what God wants to do in my life. And so this pursuit of God is... is it's not just about turning away from sin, but it is, it is a turning towards God and saying, Lord, we're going to come after you with everything we have. And we're not just going to do it in a time of worship because we're singing three incredible songs this morning. That, that's not the deal. The deal is a true surrendering and being laid out on the altar and saying, God, do what you want to do in me so that I can become obedient and allow you to do through me what you want to do through me. Does that make sense? See, that was the easy part just to say yes. We can say yes, but God's not looking for agreement. He's looking for obedience. Revival will come when we're willing, like the apostles did, to say, I don't care what the rest of the world is doing. We're going to come up here in this room. <laughs> we're going to wait on you. <laughs> we're going to seek you, Lord. We're going to be obedient to what Jesus told us to do the first time. You know, them being in the upper room was an act of obedience. Jesus said, go and wait. So what did they do? They went and wait. They had no idea what they were waiting for. They'd never seen it before. They'd never experienced it before. They just knew that Jesus said to go and wait. And sometimes our problem is we want Jesus to reveal everything to us before we'll say, okay. I got news for you. He don't operate like that. I promise you, he, he don't operate like that. Sometimes he doesn't reveal the whole thing till the end. But it's our obedience that will always reveal the next step. It's our obedience in this step that will unleash the revelation in this step. And when we're obedient to the revelation here, he begins to speak. And when we're when we're obedient to what he speaks here, he's going to speak again. And then when we say, okay, God, that, those last two steps cost me a whole lot. <laughs> it's taken all I had. And he said, well, I, I got more for you. So just be obedient here, and I'm going to reveal what's next. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we, we start living a life of obedience and a life of surrender. We start moving, and all of a sudden, we get here. And we look back and it's like, geez, did God really do that? Wow. Wow. Look how far God has brought us. But it's all because we're obedient one step at a time. Sometimes we withhold obedience or we're obedient to the first step and we want God to reveal the rest of the steps. And he's like, you can't handle this. <laughs> Just be obedient right now. And so in this moment at the ocean, and when I say a moment, I don't mean 
right here, right now, in the moment that we're in. God, God began something last Sunday, and, and I've been praying about it for a month. I, God began something last Sunday when we began to talk about revival, and, and, and it began to bear fruit even Sunday night. As, as I know that there were people that were here, we prayed for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they received. Somebody say amen. I said somebody received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in our church. Somebody say amen. amen. We have to learn to celebrate those things. Why? Because you get what you celebrate. If you want more of it, celebrate it. If you want more of it, celebrate it. We have to celebrate those things. And so we know that God is pouring out his spirit and people are being baptized in the Holy Spirit. We thank God for that. But it's just the beginning of what God wants to do as we pursue God in obedience. This morning, I was going to preach on legacy and living a life of legacy and what that looks like and, and looking at the life of Elijah and Elisha. And I was all prepared, but I just know God's doing something, so I'm not going to get in his way. But there are some thoughts I want to share with you this morning. And you can stand, you can sit. Here's the deal. This service is already jacked up, so it don't matter, okay? Uh, you, so you don't have to go back to your seat if you don't want to. You can stay here and pray if you want to in Jesus' name. Okay? It's not about what I want, but there are some thoughts I want to share with you and leave with you this morning about legacy. Because legacy is birthed in the heart of revival. And you musicians, just stay up here. I mean, the vocalists don't have to, but you musicians can stay up here, okay? Because I, I like it. Is that cool? Tuga Pomoja? Aya, Sawa. Looking at the life of Elijah and the life of Elisha, we know that Elijah was a man of God. I don't even need that. <laughs> Thank you, though, Henry. Everybody give it up for Henry. I don't want him to feel underappreciated. We know in, in 1 Kings and 2 Kings is the story of Elijah and Elisha, and we know that Elijah was a man of God who who did great and mighty things, and, and his life was full of miracles. And we know that he was fed by the ravens at the Kirith Ravine, and, and God provided miraculously for him. And, and we know about the widow of Zarephath, and it was his obedience to the Lord and, and directing her, and God used him to create a miracle for her so that her and her son wouldn't die with the oil and, and the cake. And, and God used him, and we know about the greatest story for Elijah and the prophets of Baal on top of Mount Carmel when the fire came from heaven and consumed all of the prophets. And so he was engaged in this life of obedience, even when he was scared. How many of you know fear sometimes robs us of our faith? Sometimes it's fear of stepping into the unknown that keeps us from experiencing the best things God has for us. Well, I believe the ocean's gotten a little bit comfortable. <laughs> and it's time for us to begin to step into some unknowns and trust God with an audacious faith. Uh, when we look at Elijah, we know that he lived this incredible life of obedience. God was creating his legacy as, as he each day surrendered in obedience. God is creating our legacy when we step in in obedience and do what God has called us to do. But our legacy is never about us. Our legacy is always about somebody else because our legacy is a part of somebody else's legacy. My life here in Tanzania, my legacy here in Tanzania, and I'm not being prideful when I say that because there is one. I'm going to share that with you. My, my legacy did not begin with me. It, it began with a young man by the name of Charles Porter who was obedient to God and came to Tanzania and planted a church. And God invited me into this legacy in 2007 when I was working with Charles on a trip, but it took until 2012 for the actual, you know, there's a difference between anointing and appointing. God may be anointing you today for an appointment he has for you later. The anointing came in 2007, but the appointing did not come until 2012 when I said yes. My legacy began there. 
Why? Because my legacy is a part of somebody else's legacy. December 17th, 1945, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, David Ray Abrams was born. That's my father. God was beginning my legacy. But not just my legacy. God was speaking then to September 9th, 1999, when Caitlin Marie Abrams was born in Waxahachie, Texas. Braden Scott Abrams was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, December 6, 2001. And on October 5th, 2004, a young man named Barrett Ray Abrams, who bore my father's middle name, was born in Grapevine, Texas. And God knew in 1945, on December 17th, what he was going to do with those children. <laughs> because we know God is a God of three generations, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So God knew even three generations ago what he had planned for my children. And God knew that, that I would come up in, in a Christian home or in a non-Christian home or my, my family didn't necessarily follow Jesus. But praise God, on November 21st, 1981, in a small room upstairs in a church in Oklahoma City, I gave my life to Jesus Christ on my knees. And that day forever marked a turning point in the legacy for my children. And I believe that my time here will have a direct impact, Cat, on the grandchildren I've never met. My saying yes here is going to impact their yes later. So I don't live my life just for me. It's, it's about beyond me. Legacy is not about living our life in the here and now. We, we have a tendency to think that what God's doing in our life right now is for us here and now in this moment. But the reality is what God's doing in our life right now is not about us right here and now. It is about beyond. We are part of a bigger story. And when Elijah was being obedient and following God, he, he had no idea what God was doing, but there came this moment when God brought Elisha into his life and he heard from God. I know he heard from God because he did something that's so incredible. When he got to Elisha, the Bible says he, he took off his cloak. He, he took off that thing that represented his calling, his anointing, his purpose, and he took it off and the Bible says he wrapped it around Elisha. And I hope and I pray in Jesus' name with all that is in me that my time here was spent taking my cloak and wrapping it around other people because I know it's not about me. It's what God, what God is doing in me. Because see, we, we can leave an inheritance and inheritance is, is what you leave for someone. But a legacy is what you leave in someone. We can leave an inheritance, and, and most of us strive to leave an inheritance for the next generation. But the reality is that is what we leave for them. Our legacy is what we leave in them. And the greatest thing I can leave for, for Caitlin, Braden, and Barrett, it's not money. It's not a house. It's it's living a life of obedience in front of them no matter what God asks us to do. That's legacy. I want them when they're looking at my headstone one day and I'm six feet under the ground or at least this body is and <laughs> my spirit's with Jesus. I want them to look and say, man, you know what? There's one thing about dad I'll always remember. And no matter what God asked him to do, he did it. He did it. Lewis, that's what I want my legacy to be. I don't care about how many Benjamins are in my bank account. I just need to know that Jesus is in their heart. That's legacy. And Elisha stepped into that moment 
And the Bible says, that, you know, Elisha had to have known about Elijah. He had to have heard all the stories. He had to have known about the man of God who lived his life in obedience, and God did great things through. And, and at that moment, Elisha is out doing his thing and plowing the field, and Elijah comes and puts his cloak around him, and, and they have this discourse, and we don't know much about it, just a few sentences of, of their conversation. And, and Elisha says, hey, let me go tell my parents bye. And, and Elijah's like, what have I done to you? <laughs> Understand that what I have done to you is much greater than this. And we see where Elisha goes back and he destroys every bit of who he was and what he was doing. Elisha destroyed the plow. He destroyed the oxen. He destroyed any hope of walking backwards. When he made that decision, there was nothing to walk back to. But following the Lord is not about safety or comfort. It's about pursuit. And the Bible says that Elisha burned the plow and he followed Elijah. And because Elisha was willing to follow Elijah, Elijah began to pour into his life day after day after day and allowed him to walk beside him. And what's happening is, is Elijah is beginning to give Elisha his legacy. They're doing life together, and he's sharing his life with them and, and creating his own legacy as he, walks beside, as he walks beside the old sage and the prophet, and the prophet's pouring his life into him. And there came a point where it became very evident that Elijah was going to pass on. And on that very day, there were groups of prophets who would come from place to place and come to Elisha and say, hey, you know that Elijah is going to die today. And Elisha would look at him and say, hey, don't speak of it. I know. I already know. Don't worry about it. And we got, we got to that point in that day where Elijah asked the most incredible question to Elisha, and he said, what do you want me to do for you? And Elisha, in all boldness, I want a double portion of your anointing. I want a double portion of your anointing. And we know that when Elijah was taken up into heaven, the cloak of Elijah fell on the ground and Elisha picked it up, put it on him and he began to walk and immediately was faced with a situation that he had already walked through with Elijah and he took the cloak and he parted the water so he could walk right through. And the crazy thing about Elijah and Elisha, if you'll continue to read, is we know that Elijah is popular for 14 different miracles, but when we look at the life of Elisha, there's 28. Who asked for a double portion? God is faithful. Legacy. And my legacy and my prayer for me is that the next generation that comes after me will do it better and greater and walk farther and reach further and touch more, experience more than I ever did in Jesus' name. And may the life that I live be the pathway to their greatness. And may the ceiling in my life become the floor that they dance on. That's my prayer. And so as I stand here today, knowing that here in just a little while, I'm going to hop back on a plane and fly back to the U.S., I, I really was scared to come to Tanzania because I was afraid that my heart would break and I wouldn't want to leave again and you'd have to rip me off the floor at the airport. And there's a part of me that says, you know what, this is home. It feels weird knowing that I'm not going to hop in my car after church and drive through KFC, grab lunch, go home, take off my shoes, and have a nice little pumzika. Because that was my Sunday routine. I didn't, mama, need, and mama didn't need to go home and fix lunch. We just grab something fast, go home, turn the air conditioner on, and enjoy Sunday. Somebody say amen. amen. And it feels weird that I'm not doing that today. David, it feels awkward. It's so surreal. I mean, I feel like I should just go out, hop in my car, and just drive down the road and go home. And, and I was scared to come because I thought I would feel all those emotions of being scared and afraid and not wanting to leave and but I don't. My heart is full today because I've returned back to a church that is healthy 
I've returned back to leaders that are doing more than I ever could do. There's leaders that are leading this church in the midst of, of a time where probably, Cat, I would have panicked. <laughs> but yet there's a generation of leaders that are leading the ocean through obstacles and circumstances and preparing them for the next chapter of this church. And I can look with a full heart at our church board and I can look at our staff and I can smile, Lily, and rejoice, Effie, because I know that I know that I know what we did was right and the legacy lives on. But make no mistake about it, it's not my legacy. You know whose legacy it really is? The legacy of Jesus. It's the legacy of Jesus. But what about you? What about your legacy? You see, legacy takes perseverance. To live a life of legacy takes perseverance. To, to live a life of legacy means that you realize that, that your here and now is not about you, but it's about tomorrow and somebody else. <laughs> Living a life of legacy takes an audacious faith. It takes an audacious faith and a tenacious obedience. A faith to believe beyond where you are and what you have and where you're at and the obedience to chase after whatever God's calling you to do. It's not about comfort, it's about calling. Will you choose, like Elisha, to live a life of legacy, or will you settle for ordinary? It's the question. That's the question. Will you choose, Dad, to live your life not for yourself but for your children? Will you choose to surrender your personal wants and your personal desires for what God wants for you and your family and realize that most of the things we pursue in this life really are of no value when we're gone. It's not what we leave for the next generation for them. It's what we leave in them. What will it be for you, Dad? What about you, Mom? The vain pursuit of beauty. <laughs> That's a thing. Would you be willing to surrender that? Lean into your natural beauty as a daughter of the Lord and allow your time and your money and your resources to be spent investing in the next generation and not on the ends of your fingers? Instead of spending our time, dads, doing what we like to do and chasing our own personal pursuits, would, be, would we be willing to lay our time aside and say, hey, you know what? It's Saturday. I'm tired. I've been working all week long. I need to rest. Would we just put that aside and say, you know what? I got kids at home. My time belongs to them in Jesus' name. I'm going to pour it into them. Thank you so much for watching this message today and for being a part of our Ocean Online family. You have no idea how grateful we are for you. And if this church is impacting your life in any shape or form, then can I humbly ask you to please partner with us financially by giving to the church. I mean, it is through your generosity and your faithful giving that we're able to do what we do and to be able to impact more lives and reach more people for Jesus Christ with his gospel. And so if you would like to support us financially by giving, you can do so by giving through mobile money, or by giving online by visiting www.theoceanindar.org/giving. Thank you so much for watching. 
and please subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you don't ever have to miss any video or live stream. And also, share this message with your family and friends so that they may also benefit from the Word of God. We love you and God bless you.